Mr. Bryant. Present. Ms. Uh, Bryson Morsberger. Present. Ms. McKeever. Here. Ms. Perrier. Present. Ms. Torres. Yes, ma'am, I'm here. And Mr. Wade. Present. Wonderful, thank you. Hey, wait a minute, what about Ms. Kraft? <laughs> oh, Dr. Kraft, I'm sorry. <laughs> <I'm here. laughs> Dr. Kraft. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I, we, we have the agenda. I need approval of the uh, proposed agenda. I move the approval of the proposed agenda. I'll second. 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 So um, do you want to do roll call this time, Leslie, or do you? I think, no, I think now that we have everybody here, I can do a, uh, just a voice vote. Okay. Uh, Eddie, um, okay, all those in favor of the agenda, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Um, and then, so I guess we're going to go to the next thing, which uh, is the update on school operations. Thank you. Thank so you. I'll leave that to Dr. Atkins. Oh, thank you, Ms. McKeever. I really appreciate it. Um, what we have tonight is um, we'd like to give you an overview of some of the activities that have been going on. Um, since March 13th, when the governor made the decision to close all Virginia schools. And initially he closed the schools for two weeks. And most recently he has amended that executive order to close our schools now through, um, well, through the end of the school year. So um, we'd like to go over what some of the work has been uh, going on in the school division, show you where we are and where we're headed. We have Jeff Faust, who is going to be presenting, um, uh, doing our slides. So Jeff, would you put the first one up for us, please? So what you have here in front of you are the slides. And um, the first one is the announcement of uh, the school closing. And Jeff, are you running that or am I? Great, thank you. When Dr. The, Atkins, can you excuse me for a moment? Yes. Um, is there any way, uh, Jeff or Leslie, that we can mute everybody except for the person talking and then people can use the raise hand or some sort of feature to interrupt if we need interrupting? I think Jeff is the host, so he should be able to do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Jeff, would you go back to the first page, please? Thank you. Um, immediately when the governor uh, made the decision to close the schools, uh, we started to accrue, uh, many families asked us questions, teachers asked us questions. Uh, the announcement to close the schools actually came on a Friday evening, March 13th, um, close to three o'clock that afternoon. So needless to say, um, all of us were taken by surprise that the schools had been closed. Uh, many of our teachers and our students had already departed and gone home. Um, our high school and our uh, walk in Buford, they were in the process of dismissing. So we didn't have a chance to execute any plans with staff in the building. So we immediately started to accrue information about uh, the most important questions that we thought would be asked by our parents. And we created a web page, uh, a page on our homepage so that families could go to that site and um, have some information and get questions answered as they came up. Uh, one of the next things that we did was to determine uh, how we would approach um, planning for the continuity of instruction. So we set out three different phases that we would uh, use in order to develop our plans. And next slide, Jeff. And the first phase was during March 16th through the 20th. Um, one of our first priorities was to make sure, and it was a question that was on everyone's mind. Uh, what about our students and um, their meals? When they're not in school, Oftentimes our students and our families who work, 
uh, students who are on free and reduced price lunch, we have grave concerns about them having access to food uh, during the day. And we wanted to put, execute a plan, put together a plan that would help our families. So we started to establish meals. Uh, we knew because of the timing of our leaving school that many of our students didn't have their Chromebook devices with them. So how were we going to get that out to our students? And then how are we going to start planning for the lesson? So that was the first phase. Second phase was had the devices in the hands of our students, uh, had connected with our teachers, um, talked with them about where we wanted to go with instruction. So we asked our teachers to start connecting with the students, testing out who had the devices, who did not have the devices. And one of the benefits of that was that our teachers could tell us which students were not logging in. And that helped us to be able to make contact with those families and get devices in their hand. Uh, at that point, we asked teachers not to teach any new material, just to start reviewing and connecting and reassuring our families and our students. We're now uh, moving into phase three. Phase three is where we will actually start the online instruction. Um, much, many activities are going on already but we will formally start the online instruction in phase three. Here are some of the areas we wanna discuss with you tonight uh, about that student meals distribution technology, uh, our plan for the continuity of instruction and what that might look like online. One uh, that many of our families, uh, students and parents would like to have additional information about graduation requirements. Then we'd like to give you a human resources update and uh, a plan for emergency child care. Uh, the graduation requirements, I'll tell you that we have been receiving updates from our Department of Education um, at least twice a week and sometimes more often than that. But I feel like tonight we are in a place that we can actually share a plan with you that we, we would plan to move forward. So we wanna start with the meal distribution and I believe Kim is on the line and we're gonna throw this over to Kim. Thank you, Dr. Atkins. Um, hello to everyone. Good to see you again, even though it's virtual. Um, this slide just provides an overview of, of what we've been doing with the nutrition team. And it's been a, a very fast moving uh, process that's been continually evolving um, as, we, as we go. Um, we started, you know, school, the closure was announced late Friday, March 13th, as Dr. Atkins mentioned, and we were ready to start rolling with the program on the following Tuesday, March 17th. And the first thing we did was we used 10 buses and deployed to 10 sites. And that day we served um, over 540 meals. And then we continued on, we, we the model evolved that, that first week, we went to a mix of the stationary sites coupled with bus routes because we realized very quickly that to really reach as many of our students as we wanted to be reaching, we needed to get closer to them than even the, the um, stationary sites would allow. And so our numbers um, you know, continuously increased as we went along, as you can see there in the first week, we went from 547 to 644, 673 and 676. Um, and we served over 2,500 meals in week one, week two, we changed to a Monday, Wednesday model because um, we just realized that what we were doing five days a week, it just wasn't gonna be sustainable through this um, health crisis. So we're focusing our efforts to push out into the community on Mondays and Wednesdays. And we changed to, um, we changed to using a five bus system. We're using every bus that we have in the fleet that has lifts because for any of you who've been around the operation and I know some of our board members have, the biggest, um, a big part of it is just simply the loading and unloading. That is a lot of work. It takes a lot of people. Um, it, has, it has challenges, especially with the social distancing piece. Those lifts on the buses are critical. So you can see the numbers. We, we increased by over a thousand meals that went, were pushed out from week one to week two. Um, I didn't have the numbers fully compiled when I submitted these slides because we just finished serving yesterday. But um, I know from being out uh, with the process yesterday, we were I expect the numbers increased again because I know multiple sites, if not all of them, um, we we used all the food that we had. We we it's it's definitely seems to be um, gaining momentum. 
Moving forward, we are continuing to work with our community partners who focus on the Friday meal bag distributions for the weekends. And then those, are, those partners are also helping us over spring break. And then the next iteration of our nutrition program, we are going to decentralize the food prep from just happening at, happening at CHS to also to be split between CHS, Burley Moran and Johnson. Those um, other two locations were selected based on the proximity of the kitchens to the bus loading areas. Um, that'll help us disperse our nutrition staff and disperse volunteers uh, trying to maintain social distancing while at the same time we try to do this big push and getting food out into the community. Um, that's it for that slide, Jeff. So really, I just, <laughs> the thing that came to my mind, um, I, I can say personally, I don't think ever in my professional career have I been involved with the process that we've had to change. So almost each time we, each day we would do it, we would make a change for the next day or the next time. And we're still in that process of change. And I just can't thank everyone enough who's hung in there with us and, and had such a great attitude. It's been a real, um, it's been an uplifting thing to be a part of, to be honest, as challenging as it has been. Our school nutrition team, the pupil transportation team, and our wonderful volunteers could not do it without any of these critical groups of people. So just a huge thank you and a, and a lot of gratitude. It's been, like I said, heartwarming to be part of it. Another team that has stepped to the forefront in this situation is our custodial team. Um, we had started order, you know, in early March, late February, early March, uh, in the first week of March, we ordered new equipment to help us deal with this crisis that we saw coming. Um, it is something that I think is important to know that all of our cleaning uh, chemicals that we use, we have a, a dispenser system that uses three main products. Those products are already hospital grade viricidal. We pulled all the um, sheets and, and Cecil Thompson, who oversees that aspect of our operations, he was very quick to say, Kim, you know, we're, we're built for this after living through H1N1 and, you know, different staph infections or things that can happen with athletics. We were built for this with the chemicals we were using already. So I was glad to know that. But what we have done is we've added some new um, and improved disinfecting equipment. The photo you see there, the gentleman is holding a handheld mister. This helps you apply disinfectant to larger areas more quickly. Um, it doesn't replace cleaning. But when you're trying to spread disinfectant quickly and, and rapidly across high touch areas, this is a very effective way to do it. We've also ordered these electric, these carts, it's a cart system that also applies disinfectants, but it does it electrostatically. So it adheres to the surfaces longer. That equipment is, was when we ordered it at the beginning of March, we were told we'll get it by mid April. So fingers crossed, but we have started to get our handheld misting units in. Each building will have one of those going forward. Um, the team started the deep cleaning of the buildings the Monday after the closure. We went through and did it, um, Cecil and the principals, they went through and did inspections um, starting that following Friday. And then this past week and leading up to spring break, it's just been making sure we get all the misting done. The guys in the picture are wearing the masks because it is a um, you know, bleach-based solution. And if you operate that equipment for any length of time, it does, you start to feel it in your lungs. So that's why they're wearing the mask is because when you are using the misters, you need to have that type of equipment. Um, we were lucky just to tell you a funny story. One of our teachers' husbands, I think, works for a lawn and garden place, and we were able to get the proper um, masks through them because those have been a very hard thing to get. We, I think we started out with 25 of them, but we were very, very grateful to get them. So again, a big thank you to our custodial team for all they have done and for all that they continue to do. Kim, thank you for giving that report. Um, I, I do want to point out that when uh, Kim was talking about the number of meals uh, that we, our nutrition staff and our bus drivers delivered, Jeff, go back to the um, previous slide, please, uh, with the numbers. Uh, if you look at the uh, 2,540 total meals, that's actually 2,540 students. Um, when you, you can multiply that by two because each student got two meals. Here, you could actually multiply that 3,581 by three times a week, uh, three breakfasts, three lunches on some days or two breakfasts and two lunches on other days. So um, 
Thank you, Kim. And thank you to everyone, our nutrition workers and our bus drivers and our custodians. The picture that we have of the nutrition workers putting the meals together, that was uh, before uh, the governor's order for social distancing. So thank you. The next update we'd like to give you is on our technology and uh, Jeff will talk about the deployment, how we did that and uh, other features of our technology deployment process. Jeff. Jeff, we cannot hear you. There we go. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, apparently, the space bar doesn't work if you're the one presenting. Just a little pro tip for Zoom users. Um, so, uh, yeah, so one, uh, as Dr. Atkins said earlier on, um, once it became evident that we were going to be closed, um, a lot of information gathering uh, started taking place right away um, and how we could best serve our students and our community. And so, um, we looked at the inventory that we had. Um, remember that our high school and our middle school students already take home devices. So that accounts for about 1,800 devices that, are, that we have um, in our fleet. And so then we had to look to walk in the elementary schools and, and do some really um, purposeful number crunching. And so where we are right now is that we went through, we cleaned up, um, we checked that they were working. So we basically did a, did a hands-on investigation and clean up of uh, every device that we had um, from sixth grade down. Um, we box them up into boxes of 10, distribute them out to schools, um, put each computer and charger into a, its own bag after it was sanitized. And um, we're now, we've now distributed over a thousand devices um, into the homes and uh, hands of, of families and students. Um, some great <laughs> planning that happened with the principals and, and this has really been a, um, a division-wide initiative. This is not about the tech team, although I, I'd be remiss to not recognize the hard work that the tech team uh, members have done. Um, the principals and, and staff and volunteers at the schools, making sure that there was somebody there for the families to come pick up devices from. Um, everybody ran curbside pickup, so nobody had to get out of their car. Um, and we've now done three different rounds of distribution from our central rural um, inventory where we're collecting, cleaning, and getting them ready out to the schools and the schools getting the families to come get them. And then additionally, based upon teacher contact, informing um, families that may have missed that and or didn't have the ability to come get it, um, we're now doing more um, outreach and intentional delivery um, of devices to families that um, still don't have. So um, it's a thousand devices and growing. <clears throat> and we know that um, there are still some families out there that do not have the Chromebook, um, do not have a device, but we're gonna, we're gonna work to, to make that number zero. And so um, that focus has been on grades two to six. Um, and right now we're, we're busy prepping another 400 devices um, for grades K and one. Um, as uh, teachers and, and principals have expressed um, that, that they do depend upon a lot of technology resources for their instruction and in their curriculum. Um, so we wanna help facilitate that and make that happen. In addition to devices, um, we know that not everybody in our division has um, internet access at home. Um, today, we crossed the 80 uh, hotspots threshold, believe it or not. So every day we have a form um, that I'm checking and we're printing out labels and addressing them on the hotspots um, and the, getting them distributed out from the school. Um, and or I myself, I know Dr. Irizarry, I know other principals have all taken them to houses and dropped them off in a no contact drop off kind of way. So I'm just trying to get them out there. So anybody who doesn't have um, internet connectivity at home, we wanna make sure that <clears throat> we're also providing them with that resource. So um, that's an ongoing process as well. Um, like I said, we're checking that, that form every day and getting those hotspots into the hands of families and students who, who don't have internet. Um, so when you put all this technology out into the world, um, you also have to support it. So we've done a couple of things with our, with our help desk staff. One is we've enabled both chat and phone based support. So now there's a, a single phone number that can be called and our agents are online ready to answer the phone via their computers actually. So it doesn't ring a phone, it rings the computer um, with the agent sitting right there. We're also supporting online chat based support. Um, and then providing a lot of guidance and support in the form of PD and PL for teachers. So um, there's more about that later, but um, one of the things that we, we worked really hard with uh, Paula 
um, Cobra Dickinson on was getting technology specific modules and learning uh, tools um, prepared for this, um, you know, sort of <clears throat> new new frontier that we're forging ahead into. So um, all of those are ways that we've adapted and adjusted the support to make sure that we are um, providing the best possible experience for staff as well as for students and families in our community. And then there were just some fun pictures. <laughs> and I want to just be on the record, I didn't pick these pictures. I would not have put that picture of myself, but uh, this slide was already made, so I just had to roll with it. Jeff, it's actually a great picture. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. As you can see, the technology team and our principals and our teacher volunteers did an incredible job getting those devices out in such a timely manner. Um, it was impressive to watch them work and get that in the hands of our students and families. So thank you. So now the, the big part, we, we put in place the infrastructure. We have um, a feeding plan for our, our students, a meal plan for our family, students. Um, and we have devices and connectivity in the hands of our students. So now let's talk about how we plan to uh, implement the continuity of learning, uh, where we are now and where we're headed. Gertrude and Jim. Hey, can I just take a time out right here and see if there are any questions for Kim um, or Jeff uh, regarding the food and or technology? I think that that's a natural place to, you know, separate if there's any questions or comments regarding that. I have a question. Okay, is that um, Ms. Bryson Morseberger? Morseberger? Yeah. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Um, I was just wondering, um, there was um, some confusion or back and forth, and I know that the, I guess the requirements have changed, um, but can someone explain about uh, how the pickup is working now? Uh, if IDs are required, do the children have to be there? Uh, can the parents come alone just like uh, around uh, that issue, if you could explain um, how it works when kids um, or families are picking up the meals. Hey, thank you. Kim, would you, you want to take that question? Sure. Um, th there's no, uh, all the, the adult doesn't have to bring any ID or anything with them. They may just be asked, you know, who they're, who they're picking up for and they need to t um, provide the name and age of the child perhaps, but that's about it. There's not, there's no uh, proof of anything required, but we will just have a conversation to verify that the, um, that the food is going to uh, a child, someone 18 or under, that's it. And that, that's really, um, there's nothing more to it than that at this point, but we did have to get a, they did have to allow for that. And we did have to submit a waiver to be able to allow to do that, which has all been done. So when we first start the distribution of the food, um, we were, uh, an adult could not pick up the food for the student. We had to actually see the student. The student didn't have to be right at the bus or the, uh, the, the station where we were handing out the food, but the student had to be visible. Um, and so we, we followed those guidelines until we were able to submit the waiver and get approval from our State Department of Education that uh, uh, the parent or an adult could pick up the food for the student. So now we're in that phase where uh, the student does not have to be present. Uh, during that first few, uh, at least the first week and some into the second week, we were actually distributing food if we saw um, a little, little faces at the windows in the houses. Um, our bus drivers and uh, would be very uh, cognizant of looking at the houses. And if there were toys in the yard, they would slow down and, and everyone would be looking at the house to see if a student would come to the window, would peek out of the window. And if they did, someone would jump off of the bus and, and go to that home and leave food there uh, for that family. So we tried to do all that we could do to make sure that we got those meals in the hands of the students and those families. Thank you, Kim. Are we working? I've got a few questions if, if I may, Mrs. Lisa. Okay, go ahead. 
Thank you. Um, just tagging on to the, the food delivery. Um, I, I did, I participated, I think once every, every week that we've done it. And it's, it's been truly an honor to be part of that and to see all of the work um, that's, that's going into that. And also to um, be able to give some, some feedback, um, give some input, talk with different people about practices and processes and how that can be improved as far as the physical distancing piece. I mean, every time I've participated, the process is getting better and better. Um, Denise Johnson has just done a, a fabulous job organizing and each time it's just smoother and smoother. So it's it's been, like I said, a great honor to um, be part of that and to see that process and then to see um, the families and the kids showing up and just the gratitude from them um, as they're receiving this food. Um, a, a big shout out from all of us. I'm, I'm just gonna say it to the bus drivers and to the food service people and the people that are prepping all this, just um, the, the bus drivers are incredible. I mean, I've learned so much just from riding a couple of different routes and listening to them and, and, and them having that downtime while they're driving, being able to share um, how they interact with our students throughout the day um, when school is in and, and them being able to drive by, just like Dr. Atkins said, specific houses and, and knowing that, you know, there was a, a family with five um, students, you know, that there are five meals at that house, you know, the day before. So let, let's really just slow down. And we had the, the, um, microphone out and they were they were announcing themselves as they came through neighborhood so um hats off to everybody who's who's done that um you know that's been part of that process and and just thank you um to everybody um for for doing that um i did have a question back to building services um when we were looking at um cleaning the classrooms um and i was just curious as to um when we said inspections are happening, what, what's happening? What does that look like when, when people are going in and inspecting classrooms? Sure, so we just provided um, more detailed checklists. We've always had a, a cleaning checklist, if you will, and um, the, the three or four different levels um, that something could be graded at. But we, um, we took what we had, we, we researched, we, we provided more detailed um, checklist and we put those in the hands of the principals uh, along with Cecil working with our head custodians so that when we walk through areas we're talking about very specific we're talking about the actions for cleaning at a very specific level and also then the disin there's all an, a whole other list of um, disinfecting for high touch areas um, there's just a different level of scrutiny on that so it, there's a list of okay what are the high touch areas you look for in a room and so it's just putting checklists in everyone's hands who are involved in the process so that you can have very concrete discussions um, rather than just walking into a space and saying, okay, is this clean enough? You know, so just, we, we put a little more structure around the process. And then it's also, we came up with these little signs that we post on the different areas to say when the room, when, when we agree that the room is finished deep cleaning and then when it's been misted for the first time, because we needed to keep track of our progress as we work through the buildings. So that's, it's just adding a lot more structure and process to things, a lot of what we already do. And then are we keeping those, some of those areas closed off after they are um, thoroughly inspected so that they're not used again or what, what's our process there? Any, anywhere where we put the stop signs up, um, the if somebody goes into those areas it says they're supposed to notify the principal or the head custodian and that was put it on the signs and originally when we started um what we put in place we were meeting with all the head custodians late or not all the head all the custodians head custodians all all division custodial personnel we were actually meeting together in the performing arts center when the governor's order came out to, to close schools because we were gearing up for what we, at that time, for what we thought was going to be a very intense um, deep cleaning and disinfection process that we hoped would enable us to reopen again in a few weeks. <laughs> That's what we were gearing up for. Um, 
you know, obviously things have changed. And so now for everything that we're doing, we have had to be, you know, a little more flexible with allowing people to come back in and get their things. And then we, we are going to be going back through these areas multiple times and, and misting them and disinfecting because now we have time, you know, we're not racing to reopen. So um, just sort of like the feeding plan, you know, what we set out doing at the beginning, we've had to adapt and, and change our view and change our, our lens, but it, it's working and we're excited about the new equipment that we're going to continue to get in to make the work even easier. Is there any um, fiscal impact with that? I mean, is that budget, you know, do we have that built into our budget and, you know, as far as savings for that somewhere else? Um, and then as far as best practice and, and re um, applying those chemicals, I mean, are we, we're not overdoing it? Or no, we... I don't think we're overdoing it. Um, but we are, um, we are looking at areas of our budget where we can repurpose funds because in a situation like this, you know, there are certain areas of the budget now that we won't be using. Um, but then there are other things that come up like this that, you know, we have to, um, we have to address. I'll also say that, um, we have been notified that stimulus money will be coming to our State Department of Education. And so we can, uh, we're keeping a, a record of all of our expenses now that are related to COVID-19. And we will be filing for uh, reimbursement through the stimulus funds uh, as soon as we, that's made available to us. Um, and then one last question, thank you, um, regarding technology. It was just, um, Jeff, again, how are we, again, making sure that each um, student has a device? Was that by the teachers keeping track of who's logging in or who's not? Yeah, so at this point, what we're doing is, is, is it's a multifaceted approach. One is we have a record of every student who's picked up a device. <clears throat> so we know who has and we know who hasn't. Um, Cross-referencing that with both teacher contact, right? So um, especially with the elementary, those teachers know there are 24 students um, who's in their class and all of that. Um, and so they were looking for participation and, and who's online and who's not online. And then also principals are doing outreach as well, um, looking at participation. So it really is a, it's a three-pronged approach between us looking at activity, teachers talking, principals talking, um, and our own inventory that we can cross-reference. So it's all of those things. Great, thank you. And if, if a teacher um, reports to a principal that a student is not logging in, the teacher has tried to contact in a, in, uh, by phone, um, the principal then will attempt to contact the teacher. I mean, contact the family. If the principal cannot contact that family, then the principal calls uh, Dr. King, Kendra King, and gives her the name of the students that they have not been able to contact. Dr. King then will work with our social workers and uh, we then will move to try to locate the student and get them connected, um, communicate with them in that manner. Kim talked about the food services and the delivery. We wanna make sure that we recognize all of our community partners who have come alongside us in this effort. They've done a great job. Denise has been out working with and strengthening those relationships um, during spring break, we have community partners that will be um, taking our routes for us to continue uh, the delivery of the meals, loaves and fishes, uh, the Food Justice Network, Pearl Island, PBNJ. There are a whole host of, of partners in our community who are working with us and have been a vital part of our distribution. So we just want to say thank you to all of them. This is LaShundra. Can I ask, um, I just had a, a couple of follow-up questions. Um, as far as the uh, staff that are going in and working, um, the custodial staff, the drivers are, I know we were talking about the industrial strength um, materials they were using, hospital grade, um, but are we, is there any issues with uh, PPE or any needs of, you know, people working um, for the schools right now who are out doing the work, any needs that they have or that we're anticipating. Um, I know we're social distancing, but I just don't know how closely um, like the bus drivers are working when they're delivering the food just to make sure that they have what they need. 
Um, that was one of the questions. And then the other question was for Jeff about the devices. Is there a place on our website uh, where, or where is the, you were talking about a number and a help desk. Uh, is that all centrally located on the school board's website um, for people needing help with the IT or the Chromebook portion? So uh, for the personal protective equipment question, we have made sure that um, the folks who are operating those misting machines, they know they do not do that without the, um, they're like the type of mask you use when you spray paint or work, they're appropriate for that type of job. So we, we do make sure they have masks. Gloves we have for the nutrition workers, for the custodial staff, gloves are something that we, we do have and we've been using. Um, as far as like a broad distribution of masks, um, I know some volunteers, I think I heard had, you know, come to, when they would come to volunteer, maybe they, they would, they wanted masks. We don't have them. We have not been able to get them. Um, but the current recommendations are, you know, if, if you're not symptomatic yourself, and if you are symptomatic, hopefully you're not coming out to volunteer or do anything else. But then I don't believe they're still, you know, making any type of recommendation about masks unless you have symptoms. So I have seen some, um, bus drivers wearing masks and so forth. I don't know how that, you know, they just, that must be a personal choice for them and that's great. But unfortunately we've not been able to get um, masks to provide, you know, in any kind of a widespread basis. But that also isn't the recommendation as I understand it currently, but we do have um, gloves and the folks using those misting devices absolutely have to operate them with the masks, which we do have. Kim, um, um, hi, this, uh, this is Sherry. Can I just comment on that, uh, Kim? Um, that uh, I, I'm just reading today that those recommendations for masks are changing. And I think there's going to be a recommendation that uh, anybody out in public wear some kind of face covering mm -hmm. um, going forward. So it may be something that we will we'll have to try to figure out for people who are uh, distributing the food, um, yeah. you know, or, or other other people who are in contact with the public, with our with our students. We have really been important. online to see if um, we could order some of those um, mm -hmm. PPEs, and so we'll continue to look to see if we can actually get some of those on hand to be able to give out to our employees. Um, but while we're doing that, we would encourage our employees to see also if they could locate. Uh, any mask or, or those PPEs so that they can bring them with them. Uh, there are some um, individuals in the community who have started making them out of right. cloth and very stylish, but uh, there are some out in the community that are being made now. So we would encourage each person, if that's the recommendation, that they try to locate one and use it. Yeah. It is a challenge. Every order we've placed for masks so far, we've, we've been bumped out or canceled because we're not a health um, healthcare yeah. uh, institution. Right. And uh, also when I reached out to the Regional Emergency Operations Center at that time, they were still um, prioritizing the healthcare facilities, but um, we will continue to look for different ways. Like Dr. Atkins said, I think that's great. And thank you for that update on the recommendation. Sure. Uh, and can I just say a huge, um, Thank you and expression of gratitude for uh, all of you guys, the, the teams that have sprung into place to uh, do this. Um, these, are, these are huge tasks um, to accomplish in a very short period of time. And uh, I'm just so um, you know, grateful and appreciative uh, at you know, our personnel and what we've really been able to rise up to do um, and I, I, you know, it's really from the perspective of this board member, um, you know, it's wonderful to be able to have such confidence in, in the teams that are on the ground and, you know, trying to cope with something that is um, so new to all of us. And um, anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I really feel like that we can, uh, we can, we'll all have our opportunity to say thank you, but no doubt that that is the whole, um, the, 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 the board's um, feeling is uh, well, certainly one of gratitude towards the hard work that the team has been doing. Um, that, that is not, um, 
I just want you to know that's not just one board member, it's like the entire board. And I think our whole community has been really impressed and grateful for um, the incredible way that this team has come together to um, feed our children and try to start the um, learning, uh, distance learning with our teachers and staff. It's just been remarkable. And um, so it's, it's uh, you know, we can all say thank you in a minute, but I also want to make sure that Jeff gets an opportunity to answer Lashandra's question. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I was, I was trying to, uh, but um, thank you for, for making space for me. Ms. McKeever. Uh, so Ms. Bryson Morseberger, the, the short answer is yes. Um, we've prepared several resources to help people find the, the right support, um, posted them to the web, shared them with principals to share it with families. Now, that being said, I also want to be um, um, very transparent. We want parents to be contacting teachers first. The reality is that the majority of questions that come in are going to be instructional and not technology-based. So what we're asking and the communication coming out from principals is please contact your child's teacher first. Um, and then if the teacher says, oh yeah, this is a tech support problem, they have um, a direct link, a direct flyer, and several different resources they can share with them to get directly in touch with us. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, I wanted to ask one question about uh, devices. You know, I, I got one for my second, third grader, and I just wanted to make sure, do we have enough devices for K through four to take home? So I would say through the generosity of our community, the answer is yes. And, and what, what people are being generous about right now are things like sharing devices in their home, using their own personal devices, um, and, and not, being, not being greedy about, about this offering. Um, we, have, we have exactly enough devices uh, for grades 2 through 12. So what we're doing right now is we're relying on some of the reserves, um, relying on uh, some of the you know five to ten percent that we have that may be up for repair at any given time. Um, we sent out a huge uh, batch last week for repair that we had collected um, through our processing, and so we're looking for another thirty to forty to come back to us. Um, and what we did, we sent them out because it's just going to be faster right now because of the supply chain issues from China. We cannot get parts for repairing. So we're dependent upon one of the Lenovo repair centers that actually happens to be out uh, in Eastern Virginia um, that has parts in a warehouse to fix them for us. So the good news is the warranty we have on the devices covers that cost, um, but it slows down the break fix process for us a little bit. So the long and the short of it is if every single family and every single student grades K through 12 came to get a device, the answer is no, we don't have enough. Um, but what we've been using is a 0.6 calculation. I'm assuming 60% will come. And we've actually been seeing more around 0 0.5, 0 0.52. Um, families who decide to share, families who opt not to get a device, families who let us know they have a device. Um, so of that, and again, that's not grade seven through 12. Grade seven through 12, it's it's 90% plus, right? Those kids already have them and very few opt out of it. But um, for the grades K through um, six, where we've done the distribution so far, we're seeing that 0 0.5, 0 0.52 number. So we're calculating with 0.6. And right now, um, we have what we need to cover that and to do the K1 pickup as well. Um, and, you know, we've also been, uh, I've been, uh, you know, shaking some trees and trying to find that supplier that still has some sitting in a warehouse somewhere. And I've got a couple of good leads if we do want to um, expedite and order, you know, a few hundred um, just to backfill and make sure we have them. I, I've actually got a couple of suppliers that have them for us. So I also want to just, um, well, I guess we're going to go into the continuity of learning now, if there's not any other questions for Kim and Jeff around technology, custodian, and nutrition. Ms. McKeever, we do want our families to know that we will have another distribution on Tuesday, April the 14th, which is the Tuesday after spring break, and that deployment will be for our kindergarten and first grade teachers, and we'll be posting something on our website and sending it out to our families. Um, very soon. Um, and so I'm just going to move on then, I guess, to Jim uh, Henderson around the continuity of learning. Okay, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Ms. Atkins, Henderson. good, Thank good you. evening. Good evening. Um, Gertrude and I, first of all, would like to acknowledge our coordinators and many of our teachers who worked hard, were creative, and we're efficient in getting out this new learning in a short period of time, as well as our principals who provided feedback all along the way. So hats off um, to all of those folks who made this uh, work and, um, and we're very proud of them. Um, 
Regarding the new learning update, um, I'd like to address, first of all, three facets, purpose, process, and payoff. Uh, regarding the purpose, um, we wanna make sure that we provide parents and instructional staff guidance on organizing a student's daily schedule and on instructional activities that will keep students engaged in learning during this extended school closure. Our process uh, is to identify the specific content that has not been taught as of March 13, 2020, and develop a equitable plan to incorporate the missing content. And lastly, and most importantly, is the payoff. Um, our CS, uh, CCS learners will provide consistency with regard to instructional expectations, equity to the extent possible, and flexibility so that continued learning is encouraged and supported. And most of all, our families and staff can focus on their own well being. Gertrude? Good evening. Thank you, Jim. Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Atkins, and my division level colleagues. I trust that we're all being safe, practicing CDC guidelines so that we can stay well. And as Mr. Henderson said, coordinators, principals, and teams of teachers have been working diligently to get our continuity of plan in place as quickly as possible. As Dr. Atkins told us when we started down this journey, there is no way we can replicate face-to-face -face instruction. While many of our teachers have dabbled in creating online and blended learning activities, many have not. This new approach to teaching and learning is having an even greater impact on our families and students as they deal with fundamental life issues. I will share our plan for continuing instruction during these challenging times. We began the process by focusing on what had not been covered um, as of March 13th. And the coordinators, principals, and teachers decided to uh, focus on the power standards, those that would help our students be ready for the next level of schooling after this school year is done. For our pre-kindergarten, first kindergarten and first grade students, coordinators and teams of teachers have created learning packets, uh, learning workbooks for our students, which are being printed as we speak and will be mailed to their homes. These documents have been reviewed by principals and division level instructional leaders. Links to the paper documents will be provided in our division learning on our division learning resources page. And you can see the cover of two of those documents. They're very, uh, those documents will be posted on our, our web page and they're very exciting, very um, engaging and inviting for our students, for our youngest learners. Our second through fourth grade students have been provided devices as Jeff just said. And so those students will be provided their learning activities through the Seesaw platform in an online learning environment, which our students are already familiar with as they have been using it throughout the school year. The first set of lessons have been designed by continuity of learning teams led by coordinators. And these teams are designing the schedules and lesson activities so as not to overwhelm our second through fourth grade teachers who may have limited experiences with online teaching. These teams are designing the lessons and we will gradually turn these lessons over to schools and then teacher teams in PLCs under the guidance of their principals will design and deliver the remaining lessons this year using the Seesaw online model. Our fifth through eighth grade students and teachers are delving more deeply into virtual learning. And it is not virtual learning in its purest sense and is more like emergency remote teaching. While teachers and students have more familiarity with the electronic teaching tools, teaching this way all the time is a shift for them due to this crisis that we find ourselves in. What we're doing is providing access to instruction and instructional supports in a manner that was easy to implement and as reliable as we can make it during this emergency. Grades will not be given on the work the students are doing. Lots of feedback will be provided to students and provided as lovingly as possible. Grading would add to the stress of our students and families. I asked Dr. Hastings and Dr. Turner to share an example of their virtual learning platforms. And I wanna call attention to the one on the left, the Walker platform. And you see the title of that lesson activity is Playground Design Part Two. This is a real world experience that the students actually started earlier in the school year. Two architects provided the students with design, some parameters about the Walker Playground, and students are using their critical thinking skills, their math skills, their measuring skills, 
to actually lay out a playground and do activities, activities surrounding the design of an actual playground. And lots of good things come when you may be sequestered and have to think outside the box. And so we don't know if our students might not come up with the design that we use to have that playground at Walker School. So that's very exciting. And then um, the Virginia Department of Education has provided guidance for our high schools. So Dr. Irizarry has developed the CHS uh, continuity of learning plan, addressing the expectations for students who were passing the course as of March, 4th, March 13th and opportunities and expectations for all students to be successful by the end of the school year. Teachers are created, creating continued learning modules designed to cover important concepts that can help students be ready for the next course that they will take. They will also design recovery mod, uh, uh, review modules to help all students improve their grades and address skills that need shoring up. All in all, our coordinators, administrators, teachers have done a phenomenal job in trying to quickly design instruction in a new landscape. Families and staff will provide feedback to teachers and principals, and we will make adjustments as we move forward. Now, in keeping with our focus on every learner, we conducted a need survey in March to find out what supports our teachers would need in order to teach in this online environment. 273 teachers responded to the survey. The virtual learning embed PL course that we've been using has been updated. It's a Canvas course and it provides the resources and any supports teachers identified in the survey. Topics include how to access and assign work in Seesaw and Canvas, best practices in online learning, quick tutorials on how to screencast, as well as some self-care practices. We will be using this platform to showcase the creativity and inventiveness of our teachers and staff and students as we move forward. In addition, our literacy learning team on the next slide, Jeff, <laughs> um, is continuing their work on our pilot Reading Rockets course and 33 reading specialists and special education teachers yesterday, April 1st, started on a course, started a course, a reading course with a UVA professor, Dr. Tisha Hayes. And uh, those teachers will be learning ways to provide structured literacy intervention in an online environment to our students. And we will uh, poll our, our families to see when they're ready for that, for those intervention sessions to be delivered. And we'll gradually move into that delivery to support our students and families who need that. While we have a responsibility to continue our focus on teaching and learning, we also have a laser focus on the safety and well being of all of us. We want our students and staff to be safe, be well, keep learning, and keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Gertrude. You, um, Gertrude that was great. Um, and now, Dr. Atkins, what's next? Right, does anybody have any questions for? Um, Mr. Henderson or uh, Ms. Ivory? I have some, but I, is Dr. Atkins going to continue to talk about the online learning? Because um, it could probably wait until after she speaks. I'm going to give you a, a bit more detail and some of the uh, structure that we have put around the online learning. So that may answer some of your questions or, or we'll be certainly glad to entertain those questions. I'll wait. Thank okay. you. So next we'd like to do, uh, go into graduation requirements. Um, the senior year for our students is one, uh, is, the, is the time that our students are supposed to be coming into their own and feeling as if they have reached the end of a series of requirements and they now have accomplished what everyone in the community wants them to accomplish, their families, their friends, and it's a year and an opportunity for them to actually shine in our high schools and to um, be the, the young people that we know that they can be and aspire to be. They've uh, completed their college applications. They've gotten acceptances into college. Uh, they've, started, they've worked on their yearbook. Um, they've uh, had all of their prom planned. There were so many inspiring plans and, and activities going on at the high school with our seniors um, that marks their senior year. 
And unfortunately, because of the closure, um, many of those activities have to be put on hold. But one of the messages that we want to give to our seniors is whether they engage in um, the yearbook um, development, whether they are at the prom or no matter what they do, they are still uh, students that have gone through our school system and they are individuals that we hold in high esteem. And although our school division is closed, we're still working on creative ways that we can have culminating uh, meaningful experiences for our seniors to celebrate the work that they've done and accomplishments that they have made. The State Department of Education has um, looked at uh, the impact of the closure on our seniors and has developed uh, based on the governor's um, guidance and the governor's order executive order, uh, some guidance for graduation and some waivers for graduation. So what we'd like to do now is talk to you about some of those. Uh, Dr. Irizarry is on the phone with us. So we're gonna start with our seniors and then I'll go all the way through to our elementary schools on some of the waivers and processes that we'll be using. Dr. Irizarry. Yeah, so can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah. Good evening, Madam Chair, Dr. Atkins and board members. Um, we are working through, and uh, I just want to echo the thoughts. Uh, you know, this is, is not the senior year, uh, the school year that any high school student expected, but especially our seniors. Uh, in speaking with them, you know, even just being seniors in the hallway, something as simple as that is, uh, you know, they're, they're in their homes with their parents and, and, and with extended families a lot of times. And, uh, so we're, we're trying to stay in constant communication and thinking outside the box on, on how to engage them. So um, if, do we wanna start with uh, our seniors first, Dr. Atkins or? Yes. Or, okay, so our seniors right now, what we're trying to determine is which students um, we're, we're passing as of that March 13th and making sure that they stay on track uh, to graduate and that they have the subsequent skills that they'll need for their post-secondary plans. So right now, our counselors are looking to make sure that see all of seniors that were in their uh, graduation required classes that were on track to graduate, uh, we want to make sure that they are still on track to graduate and that we are continuing to make sure that uh, they're going into their colleges, job force, um, wherever they were going. We want to make sure that that stays continuous. Um, right now, we do have some seniors that did need some additional support as of March 13th. So we're making sure that those seniors uh, have the ability to work with their teachers on individualized graduation plans, make sure that they are uh, passing um, and meeting the standards we need uh, to give them their, not only their standard, but in some cases their, their verified credits as well, to make sure that all of our seniors can graduate next year. So um, right now our seniors are engaged in review modules and those have been set up the past two weeks just so students didn't lose any ground. And our seniors right now are uh, our counselors are working with them to make sure because colleges themselves are really scrambling to figure out what those admissions requirements are and how that, how, you know, how that's changing with, uh, with our colleges as well. So our counselors are helping them navigate those waters uh, as we speak as well. So um, that's where we are with our seniors. We want to make sure that they're on track. And if they were on track uh, as of March 13th, that they have continued learning modules, because the fact is, um, a student in, let's say, Algebra 2, they're going to need those skills um, that we have not covered yet when they get to college or when they get to community college or when they join the job force. So we want to make sure that uh, they have the opportunity to complete all of those standards as well before they move on to the next step. Um, and we want to make sure that our seniors that need that additional support. And um, it takes a lot. Um, in the building, you know, if you've been to walk or you've been, uh, you know, you've met some of our senior mentors and our link crew mentors, it takes a lot sometimes for students, um, especially our seniors, to make sure that they get to that finish line. And it takes a lot. And that's with students coming into the building eight hours a day, um, you know, getting a breakfast, getting a steady lunch, uh, having access to reliable uh, wireless and, and, and counselors and their teachers and their admin. And even then, you know, it's a heavy push. So we want to make sure that none of our students, uh, because of the situation we're in, um, and those supports not being in the traditional format, that they still have the supports they need 
to graduate and that our circumstances um, don't derail any post-secondary plans that they may have. Thank you, Dr. Irizarry. So he has um, given you a scenario one and a scenario two. Um, we have Dr. Irizarry, your plan up. So okay. scenario one, you wanna go through that? Yeah, let's go scenario one. So a student that was passing as of March 13th, that was the, the governor declared that uh, the last day. Uh, every um, Dr. Student... Irizarry, can I just yes. like, I just wanna confirm because we were talking about seniors is this specific to seniors or is this just the high school? Like, can you define what these scenarios are designed uh, for? Yeah, these would be for, for both. We wanna make this plan as simple as possible for all of our students. So I'll go through these and we have any senior specific questions, I, I can you know I can answer those. So the student with a uh, current passing grade as of March 13th, um, again, they have access, every student has access to the two weeks of review modules that were just spiral review for uh, every, every course they were in. From there, Students have the opportunity to complete continued learning modules moving forward, and those will be posted every two weeks in Canvas. Teachers will uh, release those modules. Uh, those will include activities and the standards that they have not covered yet. And those will also include uh, office hours every Friday for every course that we have. Um, so students can interact uh, face to, well, not face to face, virtually uh, with all of our teachers and all of our counselors on Fridays. And once they complete those, um, and given the, the March 13th that they were passing, uh, we will award, um, uh, a, they will pass that class and we will award them with uh, an A, which means they met all of the standard, um, all the standards uh, required to graduate. For scenario two, a student that was not on track as of March 13th, again, a lot of them are still engaging in those two week review modules, which are good for everyone. And then they must complete those continued learning modules. So we're gonna work with them. Those are gonna be part of their uh, individualized graduation plan to make sure that they do uh, get back and review those uh, standards that they may have uh, not mastered up until March 13th. And they'll have exposure again to those uh, continuing learning modules as well because every senior is going to need uh, all of the standards in those courses to be successful uh, in their post-secondary plans. And once those are completed, and uh, there's no hard set deadline. We're gonna say May 22nd, but if students need to go into the summer, um, you know, we're gonna work with each one of our seniors to make sure that uh, because of this disruption that their learning is not disrupted. And once those, satisfa once those requirements are met, those students will uh, meet those requirements and uh, they will also uh, receive uh, that A or that pass. Um, I see that Dr. Kraft has a question. So if you don't mind holding, uh, Dr. Yes. I do. No, I don't. I don't have a question. Okay, I just see that your hand is up over that here. That was from before. I did that okay. before, so okay. it's not not now. Great, um, Ms. Torres. So, it, um, Dr. Irizarry, do you have more on these scenarios that you wanted to go through? Actually, yes. I have the next slide, Ms. McKeever, um, that we're going to talk about um, some of the um, waivers that the state has given and how we, we will take our seniors through that and our counselors are working on that now. Okay, so um, before we get to the guidance on graduation, does anybody, do anybody have any questions about the continued learning plan um, as presented by Dr. Irizarry? I do, please. Yes, Lisa. Um, Dr. I, thank you. Um, just for clarification, so the opportunity to complete continued learning modules, does that begin on the 13th, is that correct? And is yes. that just focusing on um, the remaining standards per class um, that the teachers and you all feel have not been covered yet? Correct. Those will go live uh, after spring break. Uh, they will be released every two weeks. And, uh, and I, I want to stress that students will still have the opportunity. Yes, and those will cover the standards that we have not yet covered. And students will have the opportunity to work uh, individually um, or interact uh, virtually with their teachers on Fridays. So um, we're working with our teachers right now to make sure that um, there's no overlap with those Zoom uh, classroom meetings and uh, tutorials. Okay, and then are those, um, so once we get to the 13th and, and the um, continued learning modules, are those being graded or is it just kind of a, a pass, you know, we did it or we didn't do it type of thing? The activities associated with those will not be graded but they will be, but they will, uh, teachers will be providing feedback. So there will be 
tasks associated with them, whether that's a reflection, whether that is a video response, whether that is a, um, you know, a, you know, some videos going back and forth, some creative ways that we have with, uh, with we video and some of uh, our technology platforms to produce some authentic learning um, more in the lines of uh, project based assessments, as opposed to your traditional um, multiple choice tests and exams um, that we would traditionally use in, in conjunction. So they will be given feedback, meaningful feedback on all the work that they do produce, um, but, but they will not be graded traditionally. And then I've had some parents reach out to me, um, students who are taking um, like algebra two or, or um, what do we call that? Standards based where they're, they're being graded individually like that on, on different standards um, and have struggled, you know, say up until March 13th. Mm -hmm. But with those courses, you know, they have the kids have the opportunity to retake those standards is that still being offered? I mean, and, and if they're doing all of the work there and they fall into scenario one, they're gonna end up okay at the, at the end of the year. Is that correct? That is correct. And uh, the great thing about standards-based math, it was, it's never about the grade in standards-based math. It's always been about mastering those standards. So those will, teachers will continue to work through those standards with, uh, with our students. And um, we know that there's gonna be a heavy lift no matter how great these uh, virtual lessons are, there's going to be a lift next year with students going into subsequent classes regardless. So the great thing about math is we're going to know exactly where those students were when they left the school year. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of spiral review more than usual that we're going to have to do first quarter next year. And uh, even through some virtual boost, uh, boost sessions over the summer to make sure that students uh, don't lose ground. But, but yes, our goal is to make sure that they cover those standards and the student standards that individual students were struggling in that our teachers can work with them to make sure that um, they're in the best possible uh, shape at the end of this year. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so Dr. Hi, Irizarry, I wanted to just um, say a couple things about this because I think fundamentally this is fair uh, and equitable for our students who are um, kind of encountering this very uh, uh, unusual situation. Um, but I do think that this is going to require um, for a lot of the students who are gonna be applying to colleges, like obviously the colleges are going to have to work to be able to differentiate students somehow. And that's really gonna fall, I think, pretty heavily on teacher and guidance counselor recommendations. Um, that, and we are, I feel like our guidance department is not, um, at 100% right now, you know, we've had some some issue, you know, obviously with the passing of guidance counselors and new hires and people leaving, it's going, you know, we're going to really need to focus on those, um, you know, and, 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 and make sure that children who, students who need the recommendations to differentiate themselves um, in the first quarter application process are gonna get that support that they need next, next year. Yeah, so we've been in contact, uh, a constant contact as much as possible with college admissions. And right now, um, what they're doing, we just got feedback from Harvard, for example, and Harvard wrote us back and said, um, due to uh, the situation across the nation, that they are well aware that pass fails or, um, you know, A's and F's, wherever we go with this, they're, they're going to be, uh, those are not, uh, they assured us that those are not going to negatively impact students' admissions. And that's coming from Harvard and some of our other uh, select universities, uh, UVA as well, most of our colleges are going to pass fails and, and things like that. So what we're working with our counselors, our counselors and, and even Mr. Bryan can speak to this, um, they, those letters of recommendations that they make are very all encompassing. So they go to those individual teachers, they, provide, they get that feedback from the teachers and what we can make reference to for those students going to, uh, going to colleges is to say, hey, when, when, when we shut down schools on March 13th, uh, you know, Eric was doing well, you know, he had a, he was doing very well in all of his classes, you know, he's collaborative and he was a, he, you know, he's a strong student. And we're going to make sure that we speak to those strengths moving forward uh, in those recommendation letters. And our counselors now are, are working on what that's going to look like. And also we're getting guidance from the admissions offices as well. And, and, and what they're letting us know is that, you know, a lot of schools are going in this direction across, you know, across the nation. So they're, they're going to be very flexible in, in, in what that looks like. And, you know, this is not for just our seniors this year. It's going to be 
we're going to have a wave of students that, um, you know, across this nation that will have, um, you know, some, I'm going to say differences in, in traditional transcripts moving forward. And we're going to note that and we're going to work with not only our uh, families, but our students and those admissions officers to make sure that, uh, you know, we can capture uh, all of the students' strengths. Is there any way that we can provide, um, okay, so one of the things when I spoke to, you know, parents and, and uh, admissions folks was uh, just having some level of continuity. So if you only have your ninth and 10th grade year transcripts um, and you don't have any uh, grade level actual grades that have any meaning um, for your 11th grade year, can, when you apply, say November of your senior year in six months or whatever, can we provide first quarter grades to the, on, for the transcripts to those colleges? as a way to demonstrate that, hey, you know, everything didn't go to heck in my 11th grade year. So what we'll do is there, there are a lot of questions like that that are still out that we have to sift through um, and work with the counselors at the high school, work with uh, Eric's team at the high school to put in a comprehensive plan to address that. That's a legitimate question. It's a valid question. And we want to make sure that we give careful thought to how we do that so that we can position our students the, in the best manner possible. Um, if you can, on this slide, you can see that as the student goes through the modules, they end up with an A on the report card. We talked about whether or not we would do the pass fail. Um, or we would do the letter grade. Um, and we landed in a place in which the pass fail, we didn't have a lot of concern about students going off to college this year, but for subsequent years, we had real concerns about how colleges and universities might perceive a P on a student's report called, on the student's transcript. Uh, NCAA has told us when students uh, present their transcript to them. If there's a P on the transcript, NCAA considers that um, to be the lowest grade possible before failing. So what well, but they we all did, know that things are different right now. And that in like, I mean, even when talking to admissions counselors today, they say basically, um, you know, this is going to affect years of admissions. And so they're not going to be surprised to see P's on because of a and, and this is what they said. They said basically anything that is beyond the student's control is something that will not negatively affect them. And so no matter whether we do P's or A's, it's, it doesn't matter because everybody's getting the same thing. When we talked with, we, uh, as we were going through the del deliberation and, and consideration for this and talked with high school counselor, um, she said, sure, this year we know that um, admissions offices and, and those personnel, they're very aware of the situation. But in subsequent years, personnel change, policies change, and we have a tendency not to remember. Um, we're not sure what will the admissions office will be using at that time. Uh, Council also told us from the high school that um, when they send a student's transcript, they're only sending the grade. Uh, there's no space on that transcript for um, any explanation of those grades there. So she would be very concerned about having the P and that um, they could address the P through the recommendation letter. But there was concern about using that much space of that letter to address the P on the transcript rather than using the total letter to talk about the accomplishments of the student. So, um, I don't, that I, again, like I said, I don't think that, I think the A is fine. That's not what I'm concerned about. I think it's meaningless because it's not weighted and there's, but at the same time, we have a very, this is a very difficult situation. Um, and one that I think this will work just as well as any other thing will work. I just feel like parents, um, Dr. Irizarry will, need an explanation and that's why I'm asking. I'm not asking you to defend. I'm asking those are that's really the reason why I'm like very con students who are very concerned who worked their whole career and now they have no grades for their junior year, their most important year. 
Um, and the only way they distinguish themselves is by having six APs that no longer have any meaning. <laughs> so in terms of weight, so, um, I think this is a, as good of a, a, a solution as any, but I don't think that, um, but, and I do th but I do think that asking the questions and explaining these things is valuable to parents and students because um, we're just gonna, I don't want them to think that their concerns are not something that you've already discussed. That's all. Um, so one of the things that I was also mentioning is that uh, context is critical. So that's why that first quarter grade is really important. And I think mostly about the students who maybe in their ninth and 10th grade year did not do a great job. They just didn't have the maturity, but they developed their executive function 11th grade and they're finally get hit in the ground running. And they were on track to do really well this year. And maybe their ninth and 10th grade teachers don't really know them that well because they're mature enough to be engaged in the class. So I really, I, I know that our guidance counselor team, our school counselors are excellent, um, but I just want to make sure that we are um, engaging with our 11th graders as much as possible to make sure that their college applications look as, as best as they can and highlighting the best parts of themselves. That's all. Are there any other questions or comments around this? Plan? Yeah, I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, we talked a lot about um, the scenarios, Dr. Uh, Irizarry. Um, I'm sure you have some students in the senior class that are also enrolled in the WALK program, is that correct? Yes, sir. So are they also following these scenarios? Because they're sort of working off um, with, with specialized teachers on either one or two classes that's needed for graduation. So my question is, what's what's the plan in place for those students? Yes, sir. They're going to follow. Uh, they're going to follow this framework. Now, a lot of their classes are self-paced um, through the programs that they're working towards. Mm -hmm. So they're going to follow these guidelines, and if they meet those standards within those courses, um, they will be awarded the, the same credits and, and ver verified credits as well. So we're working with uh, uh, Ms. Poe right now to make sure they're on track. Um, but with a lot of their students right now. Um, you know, they were in credit recovery. So this will, mm -hmm. uh, this will benefit a lot of those students as well. So th uh, this same plan will apply and we're working with them right now. The great thing about WALK is since it was a hybrid program already, mm -hmm. a lot of their learning has not been interrupted. So they've been able to, to move through these courses um, for credit recovery, um, even over this two week period. So uh, I spoke with her today and she's very happy on where her seniors are and the progress they're making uh, despite what we're facing right now. Good. And also another question, um, each year, those students graduating seniors with, um, with IEPs meet with their case managers to finalize those IEPs because they can use those accommodations um, in college. Um, what's the plan going forward for those students to complete their final IEPs? Yeah, so IEPs right now are, conduct are being conducted as usual. Uh, and as normal. So what we're doing is we're doing them virtually. Parents are either videoing in or calling in. Um, the, the advantage to being virtual right now is uh, we've not been hampered by um, teaching schedules as much. So we've had great, um, we've had great turnout at our IEP meetings and uh, we're working towards that. So they're scheduling their, um, their transition IEP meetings as we speak and those will continue as normal. And we will make sure that those seniors that are um, that um, have IEPs, we're making sure that they will have that, uh, that end of year transition meeting in, with their IEP team and uh, making sure that those accommodations will transfer to their post-secondary plans as well. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, I have a comment. Uh, Jennifer, I heard your concerns and as a parent uh, of two graduates from um, the high school, uh, and I'm sure uh, Mr. Bryant can attest to it. Uh, you have valid concerns, but one of the things, I don't know if you've ever seen one, but one of the things that I can say uh, in my day job, I've seen many, many, many recommendations from school counselors from across this region. And I must say 
not because I'm on the Charlottesville City School Board and not because my children graduated from the Charlottesville City Schools, but the time and attention that the school counselors have given and continue to give to the recommendations, I feel always far out, uh, far exceed any grades that the students have, even the students with straight A's. You really feel that you know that child after reading those recommendations. I also feel that if there are any parents that have any concerns or if they feel they don't understand scenario one or scenario two or anything that comes up between, between now and whenever their child should graduate, that there is someone in that building that will be able to explain it. And it has nothing to do with what happened in you know, 2017, 2020, 2025. The students will be taken care of and the questions will be addressed. I have spoken to many parents during this pandemic, prior to, during, and probably after. And the concerns that they have have been addressed. Now you may ask a question today and because of the magnitude of what's going on, you may not get the response today but they do get a response and they can continue to ask until they understand what's happening. So I appreciate you expressing that on behalf of the parents that are concerned, but I think that everyone needs to understand that those concerns are heard, those concerns will be addressed and their student will be represented in the best possible light that he or she needs to be represented. Um, are there any other comments or questions on um, this matter before we go to the next subject? Um, I have a question. Uh, and this is, um, I guess, more for Dr. Atkins. Um, I'm just wondering if the, the, the Virginia Department of Education, uh, what type of guidance or just in our division, what kind of guidance, what are we thinking about for the future? Because I think everyone's doing an amazing job, the teachers, um, the students. <laughs> But realistically, you know, there are parents who still have to work outside the home. There are parents who are working at home and everyone's doing the best that they can. And I just, I'm worried about, you know, the added stress and pressure on, you know, the teachers and the staff. Um, just the, a realistic expectation of what we can do at this time and what we can expect um, from teachers and from students and parents um, to keep up for when we actually are able to go back into the buildings. Like, is there any planning around that? And just taking into account that teachers, you know, are doing their best, but they're also doing full-time childcare now as well with their own children. And um, just from the children's perspective, they're living through something that we've never lived through and just the expectation of what they'll be able to learn and take in and process and keep. And so that's that's my concern about just like the guidance we're getting about realistic expectations and kind of managing what we can do and you know what we're putting on ourselves, what we're expecting. I think that's a great comment. Um, we have to realize that everyone is stressed right now. And no matter what we put in place, if we don't put compassion and a process by which we do those social emotional checks on our students and our families, our teachers, our principals, our entire staff, that we're missing uh, a, an opportunity. Uh, this is not about just getting uh, the academics in the hands of our students. This is about connecting our students to, to people that uh, their teachers they're, um, that, that are very significant in their life. And they left school on a Friday and they have not been able to say face to face goodbye to their teacher for the school year. So the plan that we have put in place takes that into consideration. And uh, when you look at the amount of time that we're asking teachers to engage with the students in a week during each week, um, we leave ample time for our, our teachers, not only to cover the academics, but also to cover the social emotional part and, and try to help 
uh, understand what the students are going through. Uh, our teachers, uh, we want to always say to them, we're gonna provide you the support. We're gonna be there beside you uh, with compassion and understanding that this is new for all of us. And there's no wrong way to do it. Uh, we want you to learn, we want you to have fun uh, with this, have fun with the students, have fun with the online challenge that you have before you. Um, there's not a checklist that says you've done it right. And there's not a check that says you've done it wrong. Um, so that's yeah. the way we're going to support our staff. Um, Jennifer? Yes, sir. Um, I'd just like to add um, one quick comment before we move on. Um, I've reached out to many of the youth that I've worked with over the years. Um, you know, over the last two or three weeks to check in to see how they're doing. And, and what I've heard from them, talking with them is that they're mad, they're scared, they're uncertain. Very few of them, I can't think of any of them say, well, you know, they're not really talking about their academic grade. I think that this is, I, I you know, I, I understand that we have to address this. Um, I'm fortunate that my daughter, she's had already gotten her letters and college things, that's going to have to come in due time. But I think right now we just have to deal with the, the traumatic um, trauma of this. This is kind of adding on what's happened since over the last two or three years from um, what happened and from the Unite the Right rally. This is just something else that's um, traumatizing the, the students. And I think that I want to know more what we're going to do to address that um, before we get to the academics. The academics will come. I, from what I heard talking to counselors, that's before this year, is that Charlottesville High School and our reputation is a known quantity. They know that our students that come out, that know of our teachers and the quality of the education. And so every school system practically in the country is going to have to be dealing with this. And, and so it's going to kind of go through the system. We're going to work with it in the colleges. They're going to want students to come because they want the, the money um, from the students. Um, and so um, I'm really concerned about how we're going to deal with it once we're open back up, maybe in September or August, of how we're going to deal with the students, um, um, with their psyche, with their, um, you know, with the trauma. I don't know if we may need more counselors. I don't know what the budget is going to look like. That's another whole, uh, you know, discussion. We were working to get another $1.6 million and, and they, now they have a big hole in their budget. So um, I, 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 that, that's where I would like the discussion eventually to go. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if we're still going to have a retreat. This could be something else. It may be a Zoom meeting, but anyway, that that's kind of what where, where I was thinking of, Madam Chair. Okay, I think the next slide really does help to start um, with that. Um, Good. With that that question that Juan had. Thank you, Ms. McKeever. Um, one of the points I'd like to make with the uh, A or I uh, um, uh, designations that we're going to be giving our students as they complete this school year. Um, in talking with counselors and, and consulting with um, the universities, they would rather see us adopt a position as a school division rather than giving parents individually or students individually an option as to whether they will get a P or a letter grade on their transcript. That makes it even more confusing for the universities how to interpret that. So we decided to go down the pathway that the school division takes a position that we will uh, award the students the A or the I as they go through and then give them opportunities to remove that I uh, later in the summer or at the beginning of the school year. So what we have here is uh, graduation and the various options that um, students may find themselves in, positions that students may find themselves in and how the state has allowed us to reconcile those positions. I'll just do one or two of these and, and um, we'll leave these on our website. It'll be on our homepage so families can take a closer look at them and um, see where their student may um, be 
and see the process by which their student moves forward to graduation. So if a student was on track um, for graduation and enrolled in all, passing all of the courses, the um, courses that are required for graduation that they are currently enrolled in, as of March 13th um, of this year, the state allows us to waive uh, the verified and the standard credits and that student moves forward to graduation. If a student is on track for graduation and not passing a required class for graduation that they're currently enrolled in, that student then will engage in some online learning, uh, show, demonstrate through that online process their competency in that coursework. Then we would apply the verified and standard credit waiver that exists, student moves on to graduation. Uh, if a student was previously awarded a standard credit and has not uh, earned the associated verified credit, which is the SOL test, uh, the student, there's a waiver that can be applied to that. So going through all of this, and there are many scenarios here, uh, you can see that um, the state has taken into consideration the many different scenarios that students may find themselves in as seniors and try to be very thoughtful and careful about providing waivers for each of those scenarios, a pathway that the student has that they can uh, lead them to graduation. Jeff, go to the next slide for me, please. Uh, the um, areas here where I have waiver applied for the 140 clock hours, I put an asterisk beside those areas because uh, tonight the State Board of Education will be meeting and will be uh, voting on apply, giving us waivers in those areas. We anticipate that they will, but we cannot uh, for sure say that they're in place until after the vote tonight. And then there, Jeff, on the next one, if we have students who have not completed their first aid course, they're a senior, or they have not completed a virtual course that requires General Assembly action, we do uh, anticipate that when the General Assembly uh, reconvenes around April 22nd, I believe that they'll take action on uh, this, these two areas and those students will be able to move forward also. So um, there's been a great deal of thought put into and Eric has reviewed all of this with his counselors and each student has been assessed individually in the uh, current cohort, graduating cohort and a uh, plan has been devised to move them to graduation. Any questions? Any questions about that? Or is this next thing um, something that would be useful to also present before? Well, I, I think uh, there are many questions about standard credits and verified credits. What happens to students now that um, this year they will not take the SOL test? Um, what happens to seniors, but what also happens to students, our juniors and those who are uh, enrolled in an end of course um, course right now, any end of course. We have seventh graders, eighth graders, and into high school students who are enrolled in end of course uh, courses um, content now. So there's a waiver that is in place that uh, if a student is enrolled in an end of course class, um, the student passes that class, the student will be awarded a locally verified awarded credit. Uh, we have a policy in place that allows a school division to do that. However, in this situation, there's a waiver that allows us to award that credit without the student having to take the SOL test twice and without the student having to score a minimum of 375 on the test. So whether that student is in 11th grade or in seventh grade taking an end of course class, that verified locally uh, awarded verified credit would apply. And the standard credits uh, we, will, we will be looking at uh, for our students um, in grades um, six through 11. We'll be looking at um, 
the um, grade of the student as of March the 13th. And we will use that grade to determine whether or not the student, if they qualify for a standard credit, would receive the standard credit. Um, we would uh, look at the content that the student has not mastered or that has not been taught. And the online learning will be around the content that has not been taught. After the student demonstrates the um, competencies in that content area, the student will then receive a standard credit. Guidance for our online learning for students in uh, PK through eight. Um, the, this is guidance that we are pushing out to our teachers uh, about how to identify the core content, um, how then to develop the lesson, to start the online classes on April the 13th, um, going through June the 5th, which is the last day of school, um, how to look at the grades. For our students who are in our uh, K through four classes, the online learning should not um, be the determinant as to whether a student um, does not move on or does not move on to the next grade level. Uh, we wanna look at what was going on prior to and up to March the 13th if a student was passing as of March the 13th, um, we are saying that that student should continue to move forward and next year move forward to the next grade level or the next course sequence. If there was discussion going on about a student being retained um, before March the 13th, then that discussion can continue with the families, counselors, and making the appropriate decision. But all other students will be advancing to the next grade level or to the next course. I'm gonna pause and see if there are any questions. Dr. Atkins, could you repeat how this information, because I'm seeing it on the screen, but I'm also trying to see it on my phone because I can enlarge it a little better from the phone and whatever, but that's another story. How is this information gonna be communicated? Because this is a lot of information to take in. It is, and for most of our families, uh, Ms. year, their main question is, how does my student advance to the next grade level, get the content that um, he or she may need, and then advance, be prepared to advance to the next grade level or the next course. Um, in the fall when we, they return to school. So if a student was passing, we're gonna put this information on our website. Our um, principals will have the information so that they can respond to any questions that our parents might have. Our counselors will have the information. Um, we're gonna do a um, mini video, a vignette that will go over some of this information, the high points of this information, but it will be on our website so that all of our families can take a look at it and take their time and read through it and then ask us any questions that they might have. Okay, and in doing um, your video, um, I think one of the things that um, Mr. Wade spoke about earlier can also be highlighted again. I know there's information on our website about <clears throat> the, the whole virtual issues, but uh, the reassurance of um, the anxiety uh, that everyone's feeling, not only you and your team, but the instructors, parents, and students as well, and that the support mechanisms are there. There are various types of supports um, that you've listed on the website, but just a gentle reminder, because I think um, as Ms. McKeever said, with people being anxious, you just, if you're over anxious or over cautious, sometimes you'll miss a step. And I don't think anyone wants to feel that they have missed a step or that if they miss a step, it's irreputable and we can't correct it. Absolutely. I, I think we, we, need, we could not emphasize that too much uh, to re reassure our students and our families. I have a couple questions, please. Um, and maybe it's in the presentation coming up. Have we addressed or
we lost your audio. Lisa, we can't hear you. I'm sorry, I'm gonna try again. Is that better? Yes, yes. So I had a question about um, guidance or communication that's gone out and I may have missed it regarding AP classes and dual enrollment classes and what's going on with those for students. It's Eric still on. I'm still here. Yes. Um, we're working with, um, with the college board right now. Uh, their recommendations are coming out um, and we're gonna follow their recommendations. Right now, uh, there is uh, guidance that we'll be sending to all of our AP students. Testing will be online and the testing will be modified. Um, and I believe their cutoff date was March 10th. So what we're doing, what College Board advised us to do was to review their pacing guide, which may not align with what a particular teacher was doing um, at that point when we, when we stopped on March 13th. So what our teachers are gonna do is look at the pacing guide that AP uh, has, make sure that they have covered all the content that will be covered on that, um, on that AP exam. And that will be part of those continued learning modules so that all of our AP students to ensure that they have covered the material that they will, that if they choose to take that AP test will be covered on that AP test. So that's AP, which is separate from dual enrollment. So are there any AP questions? And more information will come out uh, about this as well. But DE is a little different. So DE, we're following the guidance from PVCC and they're continuing to um, give us details. And I think we've got the latest update as of uh, last night. So what our teachers are continuing to do through those learning modules is to make sure that they've covered a majority of that content. And we'll have information going out to our dual enrollment families. Um, they've moved to a a check, check plus, uh, pass, pass, fail. It's, it's a little complicated to get into here, but we will make sure we get those that information out uh, to our families and we'll have specific um, conversations and announcements for our DE families as well. But we do have to rely on um, what PVCC, um, <laughs> which is our community college, is, is advising us to do. So their grading scale will look a little different just because those are PVCC classes, not necessarily Charlottesville High School classes. Thank you. Um, and then the next question kind of has more to do with at the end of the year, once we get through the instruction and how that's rolled out. And um, just, I, I can only imagine the work that it potentially could take for our teachers to kind of look at as far as where our students are ending up um, and then as they transition into that next year and potentially, um, you know, whether a class is building on the next class or um, just from grade to grade. I mean, are we planning or are teachers already working together to kind of look at overlapping material that potentially won't get covered this year that, that should roll forward? Or, or what are our thoughts on that? Um, I, I would love to say yes, but the answer is no. Um, our full attention right now has been in making the transition from face-to-face -face instruction to um, the, the model that we have now. And a part of the instructions that we have given to our teachers, and they've done a great job on it, and our coordinators, they have looked at our pacing guide and identified the content that has not been taught. And then they've also identified those power standards that are critical for success in the next uh, year. So those are the ones that have been selected for uh, the online learning and the modules have been developed around those. We've also looked at our students and the areas in which uh, they were struggling students who were not passing, and we have pulled the standards uh, that um, they were showing um, difficulty with, that students were having difficulty with. And those standards have been, also been incorporated in the modules that will be taught online. Um, moving forward, after we complete all of this planning and pushing out the information, uh, we'll start looking at when might we have an opportunity to engage in remediation 
um, uh, supporting our students and uh, filling in some of those gaps that we know will exist. That could happen during the summer. Uh, it could happen at the beginning of the school year. It could happen throughout the school year, uh, but without knowing uh, when we will be through the COVID-19, uh, we, we can't do that planning now. Uh, however, we do know it, it will need to happen. And as soon as we have more clarity into the future and our budget, uh, we'll start working on that. Yes, and in no way was I trying to indicate that we needed to add that on to, to anybody at this point, but just um, more than anything was just acknowledgement of how much work is, is happening now, um, as you have stated, and um, just that that potential, you know, for that, um, that work. And again, wanting uh, me wanting to just say, however, we can support you and support the teachers and, and you know, when we get to that point. Um, I share your concern about the heavy lift that, that our students and our teachers will have uh, in the fall. Uh, this is an unprecedented time. However, it's going to give way to unprecedented times when we enter into our fall our school year. So there, there will be a lot of adjustments that we're going to have to make this fall because of uh, the position that we find ourselves in now. Are there any other questions? Yeah, Sarah, yes. Okay. I see your hand, so I was wondering. Well, I was trying, yeah, I was trying to use that feature. Um, I just wanted to circle back around to um, uh, the mental health issues uh, for a moment. And I just want to get, get a little more clarity um, as you know, I, I have seen students um, with uh, elevated anxiety and depression going through this. Um, so what, what if a student is experiencing um, a lot of anxiety or depression? Um, or what if a parent is concerned about their student uh, in these ways? What do they, they do? Who would they reach out to? And then what, what resources are available to, you know, to help that student? Well, first, if a student is going through that, I, I'm, I'm sure that the teacher is going to pick up on it. Uh, that teacher who's connecting with the student will certainly, uh, they know their students very well. Uh, they have great relationships with their students, so they will be detecting that. Uh, and then they'll, they'll notify us what's going on and we will put together as many resources as we have. And then also to pull on some of our community resources. Uh, we have a number of resources in the community that can provide the support, um, some of the support that our students will need during this time. There's a distance between us and the students right now uh, with the social distancing and with uh, other issues that are, that would complicate us getting close to the student, we would have to depend on our community agencies to come alongside us to be able to respond to the students and to the parents. Um, the way we're designing the lessons is to try to diminish the amount of stress that our students may uh, experience. So, so I'm sorry. So uh, yeah, I wanted to. You know, I can see at the elementary level that, you know, that student teacher relationship, um, you know, might enable the teacher to identify those concerns. So I'm wondering about middle and high school where, you know, those relationships might be a little bit different. And um, yeah, what would we do then? Well, on our website, uh, we have Region 10. And um, we also advise our, our um, students, the information for Region 10 is on our website. We also advise our students to uh, let their counselor know, um, to pass on that information to the counselor and, and in the online learning scenario, it'll come to the principal, come to the counselor, teachers will connect that information to the appropriate person so that we can provide those supports. Our counselors are standing by, they are listening, they're watching, they're part of this entire process. So they are not, um, excluded from this process, they're intimately involved in 
all that's going on right now and providing for our students. Can I expand on that a little bit, the high school, just to get some context? Mm -hmm. um, our counselors right now are, are continuing to work and they are uh, still available for one-to-one -one, uh, virtual sessions just like this, but obviously it's gonna be one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, all of our uh, wraparound services, including Region 10, all of those services are continuing virtually. So the mm -hmm. students that, that were accessing those resources in the building are still doing so um, virtually um, currently. And, you know, our counselors are the, are, are the biggest, um, you know, the biggest key to that. They're meeting with their students. They're making sure they're, uh, they're supported. And um, even referrals to some of those services at the high school, those are still continuing at the high school. So I urge um, if you run into those families or those parents that have concerns, urge them to reach out to their school counselors. They're standing by, they're waiting, and we have a plan to address those needs. And school-wide, we're also looking at some of the anxiety school-wide is just losing that connection. So sure. we're looking at some of those tier one, just traditionally at Charlottesville High School and you know, as a, as a city, uh, city schools, we've always come together during a crisis. And this is unique because we're not allowed to come together uh, through a crisis. So what we're right. trying to do is make connections, whether that's a virtual decision day for our seniors or a virtual, virtual talent show, we're working on ways to connect kids, even though it's going to be uh, virtually um, through a virtual interface. So we're looking at ways at the tier one level, but I would urge uh, students and families to continue to reach out to their counselors. Uh, they're waiting, they're having sessions, and they're also doing the referral services still. Great, thank you. Dr. Atkins? Yes. Uh, um, are there any other questions? I'm sorry. Great. Can we move on? Jeff, you want to go to the next slide, please? Uh, human resources, uh, even though we're involved in the uh, continuity of learning, there are some processes in human resources that still have to continue. So we want to give you a brief update on some of those processes that are still going on and critical to the support of our teachers and staff. Uh, Diane? Yes, thank you so much and good evening to everyone. First and foremost, I want to say big thanks to our uh, human resource team. We are a small team of five, but they are really cranking out the work. Um, we want you to know that we're continuing the services for this school year to process retirements and resignations to make sure people are paid. Um, we're working um, with the state on license renewals so that our teachers will be licensed for next school year and applying for waivers if we need to. Um, some of our employees have been on uh, family medical leave and we're following up with them and getting them back on track um, to come back into the school and in a virtual setting. We continue to receive phone calls and answer questions. We're receiving emails. We're trying to help our employees cope with uh, the loss of pay in some cases for, for substitutes and for some others while we are um, trying to support them in processing uh, unemployment requests. We continue to do our paperwork to process um, any grants that we've received. So our human resources are continuing. Jeff, if you'll go to the next slide, we're also gearing up while we're trying to work in a virtual world. We're also gearing up for next school year. And we all know that our employees need uh, their benefits. And so this year, open enrollment will occur and it's gonna occur from April 27th through May 8th. And that is going to be a virtual experience for all our employees. To just today, we had a meeting with Pierce Group and we are uh, putting plans into place and getting documents written and um, everyone will be receiving letters on how that will roll out. So we are planning for open enrollment. That will happen. Uh, principals continue to interview virtually for the teachers that have resigned and retired. They're submitting recommendations for hiring and we are processing those recommendations. You'll be seeing those on your board agenda very soon. Um, we're also preparing our computer system K-12 produ for producing contracts. We're currently verifying our employees that are in place and will be with us continuing next year. And we're making sure that our 
uh, positions are available in our budget before we offer contracts, but we have a lot of behind the scenes work that goes into getting ready for that. As soon as our budget comes through, we can then punch that button and, uh, and produce contracts. And as we think about the summer and what all of that brings, we have new teachers coming on board. So we are planning for new teacher orientation. Um, that's just a brief update. Again, thank you for allowing us to pr provide the update and for allowing us to work uh, in a virtual world. Thank you, Dr. Barron. Can I ask a question? Yes. For um, when you were talking about the loss of pay, what employees have lost pay? Um, I might be misunderstanding, but I thought that the long-term substitutes were continuing to be paid because they are still working in some capacity virtually. So I was wondering what employees have lost pay? There are some of our employees on our substitute list. You are correct in that our long-term subs that are continuing to do the teaching um, will receive their pay. There are some of our uh, substitutes that we call on an occasional basis to come in and sub, and they, they are the ones that would not be receiving pay uh, at this time um, because they're not doing the teaching. Um, I think um, Ms. Barron, Dr. Barron, uh, can you also explain, um, my understanding is there, there were um, people who were working basically two part-time jobs and, um, or, you know, so th there are some employees who um, are still being paid for like one, their main job, but then maybe not. So can you clarify that? And also just with respect to um, like spring sports stipend, things like this. These are ways that I think that the division has, um, has uh, there, there may, may answer your question, um, Chandra. That's, that's correct. And probably the best person to answer that would be uh, Renee Hoover, um, if Renee is on the line. She was on the line, but. I, I know Renee was on the line. If well, I'll do my. I'm here. I'm here. I was. I was unmuted. Sorry. Um, the uh, yes, the long-term subs will continue to get paid. The subs that um, are just subs here um, by day are not getting paid. We are going to stop um, uh, stipends as of a. April 15th, but it's only uh, select groups like the uh, club sponsors, uh, the spring coaches, and then the after school programs. Uh, and that, that's our EBL program. Uh, the stipends will stop in April. Thank you, Renee. Uh-huh. And I think that's all for HR. Great, thanks Dr. Barron. This particular um, uh, area, the emergency child care program uh, has not actually opened. Uh, we have, um, we've actually put this in place uh, and if we're prepared to offer this service. Um, we had been asked uh, to consider allowing our school uh, some of our schools to be used as emergency child care for um, essential personnel and specifically our medical personnel. And uh, the governor has identified a list of, of jobs that are, come under the essential personnel group. So um, Bev Catlin and I worked with the YMCA uh, Parks and Rec uh, to partner with them to offer these services. Uh, and we put all of the pieces in place to be able to offer the services. And our uh, YMCA partners uh, actually uh, were in contact with our medical facilities and other agencies in the community. And they did an analysis to determine how many students or families actually need who were on the essential personnel list actually needed child care. Uh, and we found out that 
that their needs had been met uh, and that they did not need any additional assistance from us at that time. So we just stand ready to provide this service should it be needed. We've uh, informed uh, our partners and our hospitals that we're here and we can um, move into action at any time that it's, a, uh, it's needed. Um, Travis, would you like me to go through and, and share some of the details? Uh, let's see if they have any questions, um, uh, Ms. Catlin. Any questions, Ms. McKeever, you want more detail? Uh, so you're saying that this has been, uh, so this, what, this is what you all had worked out with the Y um, um, and your partners, but that the need isn't, doesn't currently exist in Charlottesville. So you're not recommending that we currently institute this. Correct. Um, um, Bev, Bev Catlin has done. Bev, you want to answer that? What I'd like to share is that um, we've actually just gotten some some more news on Tuesday because this is uh, ever evolving as as all parts of, of this pandemic are. And um, what we have learned is that, uh, that the epidemiologists and infectious disease specialists do not recommend group child care. What they recommend is individual child care. Um, and so they, what we then did, we being the YMCA and the Charlottesville City Schools have worked collaboratively on this. We've reached out to the community organizations and let them know that we have a list of staff who have said that they would be interested in providing childcare. And with that staff's permission, if those organizations contact us, we would let them know the names of the staff members who would then be willing to move into, first, what we'd like to do is, is see if we could help them with one-to-one -one child care. Then if the need arose, we do have a, this, this model in place so that we could do group child care. Uh, this Great, is thanks, Steph. I have a quick question. Um, I know it's ever evolving and ever changing um, about the one to one or if you can do uh, less than 10. I understand that. I'm just wondering for the group um, when you were saying essentials, essential workers, um, is that from the governor's list? Is that only include like hospital um, staff or does it include because I know other states have listed people working in grocery and retail who have to report as emergency or essential workers. And I just wanted to know, um, is, do they fall? Right. We, the, the list that we got came through from um, from the, the the governor from the joint guidance document, and so under the general op operations on this slide, the admissions eligibility that lists the people who are, um, were designated as essential personnel. So it's healthcare, public health workers, first responders and essential personnel in the public and private sector. And then they gave the examples of sanitation, yeah, food. I'm sorry, can you start over? My screen froze up and I could just hear just the last sentence that you said, I apologize. I'm sorry. So the information we received on the central personnel came from the joint guidance document that we received from both the Virginia Department of Education and the Virginia Department of Social Services. And they describe, defined essential personnel as healthcare, public health workers, first responders, and essential personnel in the public and private sector. And their examples were sanitation, food, utility, transportation, and government services. So that that came from from those groups, not and that was not something that we selected. Thank you. Um, because we're not necessarily implementing this, I will um, just make this note that the $300 a week is um, wildly expensive for most essential personnel. Um, I, um, so I would hope that in, if we had to, inst if we were able to do this for our families for, because the recommendations had changed that we could also be um, slightly more flexible with respect to the fees. Um, but I don't wanna get into a big discussion about that now because that's not what we're doing, but I, you know, it, you have a very wide range in incomes um, for all of those essential personnel. And I, 
I agree that there probably is a sliding scale of some sort that might be able to be better serve the rest of the community or the whole community. I agree with you, Jennifer. And then just from my perspective um, or my opinion personally is that I would not be comfortable. Um, and I'm glad to hear um, with a group type of setting um, just from a, an infection control perspective. So I'm glad that the guidance on that at this point has changed. Um, and if we have to revisit this, um, I would be hard pressed to be convinced that a group of um, more than one student together, unless they're family, you know, or siblings, I wouldn't be comfortable with that. Okay, so um, what is the next item on the in this lengthy PowerPoint? <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> um, so uh, did you want to add anything else, Dr. Atkins? No, we would certainly answer any additional questions that you might have. I, I do want to say um, a huge thank you to our teachers. Um, all of the, the players uh, who've been a vital part of making this work. There have been numerous uh, long days, long hours, um, uh, endless work to move us to this point. So thank you to our teachers. Our principals have done an amazing job organizing their staff in a virtual way and sending out the information and really preparing their teachers um, and their students and families to move into this stage of learning. Again, I'll, I'll highlight our nutrition workers, our bus drivers, um, all of our community partners. Uh, we just have uh, all of our central office staff, our senior leadership. Uh, they have been um, working nonstop to make this kind of transition happen and to make it happen in such an organized manner. So I just wanna say thank you to all of them. And we could not have done this without their help and their support. Um, thank you, Dr. Atkins. I think um, I speak for the whole board when we say thank you um, for your leadership during this unprecedented time. Um, we just can't, um, we, we, we definitely have been throwing some curveballs, but this is dramatic, um, thank you. For your leadership and thank you like your heart is always with the students and their families and I think that's clear as day um, and so thank you for always keeping our students and their families um, and their health and safety first in your mind it just really shows and that um, leadership I, is it, it just really makes a huge difference so thank you um, you're welcome and My pleasure I uh, uh, yeah, so I've had many conversations and I appreciate um, what you have always, you're always teaching me. So <laughs> thank you for um, continuing to show me what a good leader does in that is always keeping the um, well-being our families and students first. So thank you. Um, I also uh, wanted, I need to say something about the fact that we're having a Zoom meeting, which I will do in a minute, but I wanna make sure that anybody else have any comments um, that this would be a good time to do that, make those comments. Specifically regarding timings of meetings. Make the comment about the timing of meetings now. Like if, you have, if you have a, I mean, this, we're not gonna, you know, if you wanna have more regular updates as a board, this would be the time to talk about that. I would like to, um, yes, to ask if we could do um, some type of, it can have a time limit or a shortened form, just so we're all on the same page, whether it's bi-weekly, just something, because it feels like it's been years since our last meeting, and things change all the time, um, every day, and so that would be helpful, and um, just to add on, um, to thank everyone for all their hard work. And Dr. Atkins, thank you for being available and um, ask, answering all my questions and keeping me in the loop. So I appreciate your efforts and I hope that you are staying safe um, while you're doing all of these things, as well as all the other um, staff um, and people in the division. 
So can I just ask about, um, uh, I guess we're, we're not having a regularly scheduled like May meeting um, because uh, I, I guess the regulations are that we would have to have a, a quorum physically present together to do it. So we're not gonna do that. Um, so, uh, you know, and maybe again, this is evolving, but um, so if we have meetings like this, um, are we able to just address things related to this situation and this emergency? That is my understanding of the, of the um, statute and the attorney general's opinion. Yeah, um, okay. I think a lot, given that schools are closed, I think a lot comes under the umbrella of emergency and business, um, frankly, um, especially as it relates to summer, as it relates to next summer. year, <laughs> this all planning will have to, I, I, you know, just, I take it very broadly. I'm one person. Um, I would, I just think of it as a very broad umbrella of what we can talk about in these emergency meetings. Um, but okay, yeah. Does anybody else? I mean, I get to speak with Dr. Atkins regularly, and I try to get as much information out as possible. Um, but I can also understand how, like, a meeting like this makes you, um, you know, helpful. It is very helpful to then answer questions for the larger community. So. Uh, but at the same time, I feel like staff is working 25 hours a day. Um, <laughs> and so I don't necessarily want to put additional burdens on the staff. So I would love to hear Dr. Atkins' thoughts on that. If we could just have, I don't know, could frankly be just like a, an update type, like maybe not a memo, but it's something of so some, some sort. If, if that's the board's desire, certainly we will will um, give that update. Um, we we wouldn't have a problem with giving an update. Do we feel like um, I know that a lot of the language on the VDOE site tonight or today when I was looking at things <clears throat> referenced the meeting that they're having tonight? Um, regarding some of the specific guidance, do we feel like what we presented? that you all presented today is going to change based on their meeting tonight? No, I okay. don't. Uh, actually, I have a phone conference twice a week, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays with the state superintendent. And today the governor was on that call. So, um, and that's at a minimum, um, the calls that uh, we're on each week to receive the guidance, to ask questions, um, to um, after we've gotten the guidance, we give the state superintendent questions. Um, they respond to those questions. They're working with the code, the regulations, all of that. So the guidance that we have currently um, is, is solid guidance that we can move forward. The meeting tonight, uh, we positioned ourselves to be able to continue to go forward. Um, it, should the board tonight approve uh, those uh, courses and, and the waivers for those courses. And we don't have any reason to believe that they won't. Uh, the other waivers were uh, extended because the executive order that the governor issued actually gave the state superintendent the authority to issue waivers with regulations, but with what's in code uh, that has some of it has to go back to the board. Uh, so that's what's happening tonight. I, I just want to, um, again, express my gratitude and thanks to you, um, uh, you know, for just being on top of this and being prepared. And, and again, my question earlier today to Leslie was like, wait a minute, where's the guidance on graduation? Um, and, and I had been reading up on that. So I want to thank you for 
um, being forward thinking always and being prepared as far as how you presented things tonight to us um, so that we don't have to tweak that a lot going forward. And, and again, um, I am uh, one single person here, but um, it, it's been really, it, this last two weeks has felt like an eternity, I think for all of us. Um, and it's been really hard to be um, patient um, and knowing full well that you all would have a lot of information for us tonight, which you did, and um, but to not just wanting and needing answers, you know, as a school board member, as a parent, um, and just as an individual. So it's been challenging, but thank you so much. So I don't want to overburden you guys with with more meetings i think you guys have done a tremendous and just fabulous job with with updates to the community and and to us as you're making decisions and things are being rolled out um but it is hard you know as i'm sure it is hard for you as you guys are working hard to make decisions um it's hard for us also to to sit and kind of not know um and again i know that you're always available if we wanted to ask questions but i've tried to really not do that um, anyway, but thank you. I, I, you're welcome, and I do welcome you calling. Uh, what happens each uh, time we have one of those phone conferences, and again, it's twice a week, the guidance document is changed or tweaked. Um, so over the last two and a half weeks, we've been getting one iteration after another, and we wanted to be cautious and not publish any of that information prior to it getting to a place that we felt like we would have accurate information to send out to our families. So we've tried to be very intentional in waiting until that, that actually happened. And we're now at a place that we feel like we can move forward with using those guidance documents to set the pathway forward. Uh, this is LaShundra one more time. I'm going to backtrack a little bit, and I don't want to add um, any more stress than you all are already dealing with. And so I um, am comfortable and happy to defer to Dr. Atkins's judgment on when she feels like we might need another emergency meeting or a public meeting when there's something that, because it's ever evolving, that you're ready to talk about or that you feel like they've come to a place where it's something you can give us information on. So the, I, I don't, we don't have to have more meetings. I can defer to your judgment on this one. I think um, Dr. Atkins and I can work out um, like when uh, we might need like a more, you know, larger meeting. We're not talking every day like we were. So the updates are not happening as frequently for me as well, just for your information. Um, and which is fine, uh, you know, honestly, but it, I just want to, it was changing so often and I was having to call a lot of people. Um, so now that she's not calling me every day, it's okay. <laughs> I'm not calling you guys all the time either. Um, yeah. but I think I can work directly with Dr. Atkins to say like, Hey, maybe, um, maybe now is the time that we just update everybody as a group and as a community. Um, if that, yeah. you know, so we can come up with you know, a communication plan that's more strategic, not just me talking to you, talking to another person, talking to you know. So. Um, I just wanted to mention that I, I've signed up for this webinar tomorrow on the role of the school board in this crisis. And um, what I'll, if there's any suggestions from what other places are doing, um, Jennifer, I'll get those to you. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, so, are there any other comments or questions or, that we should address at this time? Dr. Atkins, did you need us to take action on anything tonight? No, and you could not um, in this, this um, in a virtual meeting, you can't take action. I do know, and, and we're all aware that we probably, um, there are gonna be many discussions that will be going on at the state level and the city um, here with city council about budget. And so, um, as I get more information, uh, the governor today um, re reiterated that, that his focus is on education. Uh, they will have to make some state decisions. Uh, he would love to try to keep education whole. However, um, it's going to be important that he looks at the budget in totality and then um, respond from there. 
So we'll respond to whatever it is that the governor recommends or the city recommends. So we'll have to come back together at that, that point. Thank you, Dr. Atkins. Any other questions? I just want to say that this, um, per the per the notice that we had, uh, that we committed, that we um, sent out, this is um, a meeting that's going to be that's held uh, virtually as a result of um, the state of emergency as declared by the governor, um, and the items that the purpose of, that of this meeting was to address matters related to the state of emergency and the governor's announcement that the public schools remain closed for the remainder of the year, academic year, um, and. So that is um, why we're allowed to have this virtual meeting. Um, and we appreciate all of the updates and all of the work that everybody's been doing. Um, is there any um, objections to um, ending this meeting? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, hearing none, we stand adjourned. Everybody be safe and healthy. Stay well, yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.